This was Cherokee land. Almost 20,000 Cherokees farmed the valleys, fished the streams, and hunted their beloved hills and mountains. Originally, the Cherokee territory included much of the southeast. By 1820, 90% of it had been lost, and the Cherokee Nation included only parts of Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and North Carolina. By 1838, almost all of the Cherokees had been evicted from their homeland by the white man they had tried to emulate. At New Achota, their story is told. The Cherokee adopted much of the white culture, becoming the most progressive of all American Indian tribes. They learned English, attended schools, and adopted a new way of dress. Cherokee men became farmers, politicians, and businessmen. They used tools such as the plow, saw, axe, fro, and adze. Cotton and sheep produced the raw materials from which Cherokee women spun yarn for their looms. Metal tableware and European ceramics graced many Cherokee dinner tables. Grist mills, cotton gins, and sawmills operated along the many rivers and streams, and improved roads provided good transportation routes. The average Cherokee lived in a small log cabin on his own farmstead, where he cultivated about 11 acres. Corn was the staple crop on Cherokee farms, but most Cherokees also raised a variety of vegetables. Hogs and cattle were the main source of meat, while apple and peach trees furnished fruit. Some Cherokees owned great plantations. One of the most wealthy was Joseph Van, who lived in this beautiful brick home built by his father, James, in 1804. The plantation included 800 acres of cultivated land. Now a state historic site, the Van House is located 17 miles north of New Achota, near Chatsworth, Georgia. Along the roads, Cherokees operated stores, blacksmith shops, ferries, and taverns. One such tavern was Van's Tavern, built about 1805 by James Van and located originally where the Federal Road crossed the Chattahoochee River. Van's Tavern furnished food, drink, and supplies, and weary travelers sought rest in its upstairs rooms. A remarkable development in Cherokee history came in 1821, when the Cherokee government adopted a written form of the Cherokee language. It was developed by Sequoia, an uneducated Cherokee who could not read, write, or speak English, but who realized the value of a written language. For 12 long years, Sequoia labored to bring the talking leaves to his people. Finally, he isolated the 86 different sounds in the Cherokee language and gave each a symbol. Thus, the Cherokee became the first American Indian tribe to have a written language. Many of the Cherokee leaders were well-educated and progressive, and they established a centralized government with a two-house legislature. By 1819, this legislature, or council, was meeting in Newtown at the junction of the Conasauga and Kusawati Rivers. In November 1825, the council chose the site as a national capital and renamed it New Echota for the old town of Chota in Tennessee. Surveyors soon laid out streets and created 100 one-acre lots. Several Cherokees already lived at New Echota. Alexander McCoy operated the New Echota Ferry as well as a tavern. His brother-in-law, Elijah Hicks, lived nearby. In 1828, John Ross became the head of the executive branch, or principal chief. Although only one-eighth Cherokee, Ross considered himself to be a Cherokee. He served as chief until his death in 1866. One of the best friends of the Cherokee was a young Congregationalist missionary from New England, Samuel A. Worcester. In 1827, Worcester, his wife, and a young daughter arrived at New Echota and began construction of a mission station. 
Worcester built much of the two-story mission himself. Since Worcester was also the new Achota postmaster, his mission was the federal post office as well. One of the most important of Worcester's projects was the assistance he rendered toward the creation of a Cherokee newspaper. In 1826, the Cherokee government decided to print a national newspaper, and in 1827, construction began on a printing office similar to this reconstruction. Meanwhile, Worcester's missionary board set about acquiring the type, printing press, and other equipment in the north. On February 21st, 1828, the first issue of the Cherokee Phoenix came off the press. According to the paper's prospectus, the mythical bird which consumed itself in fire and then rose new from the ashes symbolized the Cherokee attempts to rise above the stereotype of an ignorant savage. The Cherokee Phoenix was a four-page weekly paper printed in both Cherokee and English and circulated throughout the Cherokee Nation, parts of the United States, and Europe. In addition to the newspaper, the Bible, hymns, and a novel, all translated and printed in the Cherokee language, over 700,000 pages in all, came from the New Echota Press. New Echota was quiet most of the year, but when the council met, the town was alive with activity. By foot, or on horseback, or in stylish carriages, Cherokees usually numbering several hundred filled the town. Council meetings provided the opportunity for a great social gathering. The Indians spent their time visiting friends, attending meetings, at church services, at dances, or watching their favorite sport, the ball play. Not everyone looked upon the Cherokee advancement with approval. The state of Georgia disliked the idea of having a sovereign and independent Indian nation within its boundaries and wanted the land opened up for white settlement. In the Georgia Compact of 1802, the federal government had promised Georgia that it would remove all Indians from the state eventually. By the 1820s, Georgians had grown tired of waiting. And in 1828, an important discovery on Cherokee land made it even more valuable to Georgia, gold. Near Dahlonega, America's first gold rush took place, and thousands of prospectors illegally entered the Cherokee territory in search of riches. Georgia declared the Cherokee Nation illegal and passed oppressive state laws intended only for Cherokees such as not permitting an Indian to testify against a white man in court. Soon, the Georgia Guard entered the Cherokee Territory to enforce these laws. Instead of fighting for their land on the battlefield, the Cherokees fought through the United States court system. Georgia arrested and imprisoned the missionary Samuel Worcester because he had disobeyed one of the new Georgia laws by refusing to obtain a permit to remain in the Cherokee Territory. Worcester took the Cherokee fight to the United States Supreme Court. Chief Justice John Marshall and the court ruled in favor of Worcester and the Cherokees, seeing the Cherokee Nation was a distinct community, occupying its own territory in which the state of Georgia had no jurisdiction. The Indians felt they had won a great victory and could now remain on their beloved lands. But President Andrew Jackson supported the removal of the Cherokees. In 1834, with the seizure of his mission station by Georgians imminent, Worcester moved to what is now Oklahoma, where he continued his work. The Cherokee Phoenix voiced the inability of the Cherokees to stem the flow of settlers and the despair with which they viewed the events taking place. The beautiful and beloved land of the Cherokee is now passing into the hands of the Georgians. Our land is wedged with settlers and droves of land hunters to which the Indians daily cry. And it is literally robbery. Robbery. The sun was setting on the Cherokee Nation. With conditions worsening, a few Cherokees under the leadership of Major Ridge, John Ridge, and Elias Boudinot decided that the only solution was to move west as the government wanted. At Boudinot's new Echota home in December 1835, 
a small group of Cherokees met with a government agent and signed the Treaty of New Echota. It exchanged all Cherokee land for land in present-day Oklahoma. Later, in June 1839, Boudinot and the Ridges were assassinated for taking part in the Treaty of New Echota. Chief John Ross appealed to the United States government, saying the treaty was not valid because the majority of the Cherokee people did not support it. Congress, however, turned a deaf ear and ratified the treaty in 1836, but most Cherokees refused to leave the lands they so dearly loved. In May 1838, 7,000 federal and state troops under the command of General Winfield Scott began the roundup and removal of the Cherokees to the west. Soldiers now filled the streets of New Echota, and the United States Army built wooden stockades throughout the Cherokee Nation to serve as prisons. Private John Burnett participated in the removal and described the event. Men working in the fields were arrested and driven to the stockades. Women were dragged from their homes by soldiers whose language they couldn't understand. Children were often separated from their parents and driven into the stockades with the sky for a blanket and the earth for a pillow. And the old and infirm were prodded with bayonets to hasten them to the stockade. Throughout the hot summer of 1838, most of the Cherokees were confined in the stockades. In the fall, the survivors began the thousand-mile march to the west. And in the chill of a drizzling rain, on an October morning, I saw them loaded like cattle or sheep into 645 wagons and started toward the west. I'll never forget the sadness of that morning. Chief John Ross led in prayer, and when the bugle sounded and the wagons started rolling, Many of the children rose to their feet and waved goodbye forever. Many of these people didn't even have blankets, and many of them had been driven from home barefooted. They traveled by wagon, horse, riverboat, and on foot. The process was slow, the winter a severe one. By the completion of the removal in the spring of 1839, sickness, hunger, and heartbreak had caused 4,000 deaths along the way. Small wonder the Cherokee removal to the West has become known as the Trail of Tears. As the years passed, the buildings at New Echota fell into ruin. And by 1889, almost all traces of the town had disappeared and the land converted into farmland. Only the Worcester House remained. Today, the restored and reconstructed buildings of New Echota stand as a silent testimony to the achievements of a civilized nation of Indians. Their silence is also a testimony to the injustices that man sometimes bestows on his fellow man. Perhaps this silence can be a lesson for us all. <laughs>